Welcome, everyone. Thanks for joining us for today's Flow Control Webinar Program, Advancements in Coriolis Technology, sponsored by Micromotion. During today's webcast, we'll cover Coriolis Basics, how it works, why it's chosen, industry applications, plus a few key developments and capabilities, including improvements in two-phase flow measurement, zero verification, and smart meter verification which is increasingly being used to extend the time between factory calibration and meter proving in the field. My name is Matt Migliori. I'm Senior Editor, Content Marketing for Flow Control Magazine and flowcontrolnetwork.com. I will be the moderator of today's session. I encourage you to send questions during the presentation using the Q&A box on the webinar interface. Please type your questions into the provider field and submit. Today's webinar will be presented by Anthony Gentile, Product Marketing Specialist for Micromotion. Anthony has 10 years experience in the area of Coriolis flow measurement. He holds a Bachelor's of Science in Chemical Engineering and Petroleum Refining from Colorado School of Mines and an MBA from Regis University. We'll give everyone a chance to log in and we'll get started in just a few moments. Okay, great. It looks like we have quite a few folks logged in and ready. We'll go ahead and begin our webinar. Anthony, the floor is yours. All right, thanks everyone for joining today's webinar on advancements in Coriolis technology. And I uh, appreciate everybody uh, attending today's webinar. And then also, again, we also encourage questions. And if we are not answering your questions um, throughout the webinar, uh, you haven't answered. We have you haven't asked your question in vain. We will get to your questions. We take every question seriously. So we'll uh, get started here with the agenda. So today's agenda, we're going to cover the theory of operation, how Coriolis meters work, why we need to measure mass instead of volume, two-phase flow detection, zero verification, smart meter verification, and how all this follows into the advancements of the Micromotion Model 5700 transmitter. So let's get started with how the Coriolis meter works. So the theory of operation for mass flow is quite simple. The process fluid enters the sensor and the flow is split uh, halfway through the sensor in the tube and the sensor flow tubes are vibrated in opposition of each other by an energizing drive coil and these tubes are vibrated at their natural frequency. So think of this as like a tuning fork. You hit a tuning fork on the table, it oscillates, and eventually it dissipates and dies out. Now with the Coriolis meter, we send a pinging signal from our transmitter to the drive coil, constantly vibrating these tubes at their natural frequency so that the vibration does not die out. Now on each side of the tubes are pickoff coils. These are mounted on both sides of each tube. Each, tube, each coil, pickoff coil, moves through a uniform magnetic field adjacent to another magnet, which creates voltage in the form of a sine wave. Which brings us to, with no flow conditions, there's no Coriolis effect, and the sine waves are in phase with each other, as we can see on the picture on the left. When the fluid is moving through the sensor tubes, as shown on the right, Coriolis forces are induced, causing the flow tubes to twist in opposition of each other. And the time delay between the sine waves is measured, called delta T or time delay, which is directly proportional to the mass flow rate. So the greater the delta T, the more mass flow, the less delta T, the less mass flow. All right, so let's take a look at the flow calibration factor. This is one of the most important pieces of a Coriolis meter, and this is the thumbprint that actually characterizes the whole Coriolis meter itself. It's 10 characters, including two decimal points. The first five digits are the flow calibration factor, and the calibration factor is multiplied by a given delta T yields the mass flow rate in grams per second. The last three digits are the temperature coefficient for the sensor tube material, and this coefficient compensates for the effect of temperature on tube rigidity, or percent change in rigidity per 100 degrees change in uh, temperature degrees Celsius. 
So this compensates for the elasticity and rigidity of the tubes. So again, this is a very important uh, piece of the Coriolis meter. It's the biggest characterization piece of it. And it's also uh, very linear. So if you were to change this by 10%, you would see a 10% change in, in flow. And the calibration factor, uh, the temperature coefficient, changes for different materials of construction. So if we had things like uh, C22 alloy or titanium, 316 stainless steel, that last three digits is characterized by the materials of construction. So let's talk about the theory of operation for density. So density is based on the natural frequency of the system, including the flow tubes and the process fluid. As the mass increases, the natural frequency of the system decreases, and as the mass decreases, the natural frequency of the system increases. So if we have something that's very dense coming through the tubes, then it would actually slow the frequency down. And if it had something that had less density, then the frequency of the tubes would speed up. So it's an inverse relationship. So let's talk about how density is calibrated and performed at the factory. It's performed on air and water, and meters are filled with air, resulting in a tube period, which we call K1 for air, and then K2 for water. These two values are plotted against each other, which makes a nice straight line for us. So D1 is the density of air, and D2 is the density of water. So if we had something in the meter that was heavier than water, we were able to measure it. Lighter than air, we'd be able to, to measure uh, density-wise because this is a straight line and Coriolis is a linear device. So another nice thing about Coriolis technology is that volumetric flow can also be calculated. So if you're in an industry where pounds per minute, uh, kilograms per minute is not valued and you want things in uh, gallons per minute or liters per minute, then volume flow is the way to go, but it could be a calculated variable out of a Coriolis meter. So how this is done is that with the Coriolis meter measuring mass flow and then also density, we're able to take the mass flow, divide by the density, and give you a calculated volumetric flow. And some of these benefits are that with the Coriolis meters that they give you things like lower pressure drop, wider turn down, higher accuracy, and higher degree of linearity versus other volumetric flow meters. So why is measuring mass instead of volume uh, actually pretty good? Well, the reason why it's all basically scientific. So as you can see on the slide, an increase in temperature causes the density to go down, which according to the formula we looked at on the previous slide results in an increased volume. Therefore, the higher the temperature of the fluid or gas, the greater the volume it will occupy. So notice how the units of mass stay the same when the temperature went up. This is because mass does not change with temperature. The bucket on the left and the bucket on the right stay, have the same mass, even though the temperatures are different. So if you have one fluid on one side uh, that you're measuring in volume versus another fluid that you're measuring in mass, you have an increase in temperature then volume is going to be more increased versus measuring by mass. Mass is going to stay the same. So take a look at a couple of questions here that come in from, from volume. So is the volume flow calculated from measured or assumed density? So volume flow is calculated from measured density, the liquid density, and then on the gas side, it would be the assumed density. Uh, Coriolis meters um, don't do very well on measuring gas density, and the reason why is because the tubes 
are um, that are heavier than what we would have for our other products. So we do have gas products that are able to measure gas density, um, but that's the answer to the question is that um, two different pieces to that, that the volume flow calculated for is from the measured density is on the liquid side, and then the assumed density would be on the um, gas side. Okay, does it matter if the tubes are installed downward like the slide shows or can it be installed up or does it or does it matter? So when it comes to installation, tubes down for liquid flow is recommended, tubes up for gas flow is recommended and the whole reason for this is to make sure that we keep air out of the line. Um, the, the better uh, to keep the air out of the line, the better. Um, so th those are just the rules of thumb. But it doesn't. If you have, it just also matters on the the space as well. How accurate is the density measurement for gas applications? So for density measurement in Coriolis meters, it would be an assumed density. Uh, Coriolis meters do not measure gas density accurately, but there are other products in the market. Um, such as the gas density meter and specific gravity meter that would be able to measure gas density accurately that you'd be able to bring in to the Coriolis meter transmitter and have that as a live density feed. All right. Let's talk about entrained gas and two-phase flow. So gas entrainment and two-phase flow. There's different sources of gas entrainment, and we we'll also want to talk about the difference between entrained gas and two-phase flow, the impact of gas entrainment on measurement, and the improved Coriolis gas entrainment performance. So entrained gas versus two-phase flow. These are two terms that are used interchangeably, and the difference is that during two-phase flow, the gas air is decoupled from the liquid. For entrained gas, the gas or air bubbles remain in the liquid and do not decouple and separate from the liquid. Severe two-phase flow can cause a significant amount of measurement error, especially meters that have a high drive frequency. Lower drive frequency meters are capable of better measurement performance with entrained gas and two-phase flow compared to high drive frequency meters. So think of it as this, if I have entrained gas, the bubbles are entrained inside the liquid, and then I vibrate those vigorously back and forth with a high drive frequency, those bubbles are going to come out of solution and going, are going to get decoupled. Now this causes severe two-phase flow, and this has always been an issue for Coriolis flow meters. Keeping the gas entrained inside the liquid is the key. So lower drive frequency Coriolis meters have better performance on entrained gas versus high drive frequency meters. So let's look at the, some of the ways of intentional entrained gas and two-phase flow. So although there are many examples of intentional entrained gas or two-phase flow, here are some brief examples. So in the cosmetics industry, shampoo, hand soap, toothpaste, uh, we see a lot of intentional entrained gas inside of those products. Food and beverage, such as ice cream, chocolate, carbonated beverages. Slurries, such as cement and titanium dioxide. So here are some sources of unintentional gas entrainment. Things like long drops into tanks, leaks in pump seals, added shaders that whip into the fluid, and pumping out of near-empty tanks. So long drops into the tanks introduce air into the system. The farther the liquid falls, the more the air is entrained. Therefore, the amount of entrained gas is dependent on the level of the tank. And we all know that the tanks are not see-through, so it's kind of too hard to see how long that drop is into the tank and where you could be getting unintentional gas entrainment into your process. Leaks and pump seals. If we have a leak in the pump seal, it's introducing entrained gas into our process. Agitators can produce a vortex that can entrain air into the liquid, 
the size of the vortex and the amount of entrained gas increases as the level of fluid decreases. So all four of these examples illustrate how unintentional gas entrainment results in process variation. And of course, the last one, pumping out of a near-empty tank, so when we start pumping out of a near-empty tank, then we end up sucking air into the process and introducing air. Empty full empty batching is another source of intentionally adding air into the process. So as we see here on the, on the slide, the rail car loading shows a process where two products are being metered through one sensor, and the goal of the process is to avoid cross-contamination of the two products. So to avoid this cross-contamination, the sensor is blown dry in between batches, so then we go from empty in the sensor to full and then back to empty again. And as you can imagine, we'll have different variations of entrained gas and bubble flow that goes through that meter. Which brings us to our next slide of understanding gas entrainment and the different kinds of gas entrainment. So there are things like slug flow, periodic coalesced bubbles that are in the tank or oil wells or tank farms, bubble flow, continuously distributed bubbles, empty flow empty batching is a precise liquid gas interface for things like truck loading and multi-product lines. So which brings us to uh, how, this, how the Coriolis meters work better with a lower drive frequency versus a higher drive frequency. So I'm going to go ahead and here and share my screen. So just give it a second. All right, so then on the screen itself with single phase, and what we're looking at here is the cross-sectional area of the tube itself. The diamond that's in the middle is the center of gravity of the tube. The arrow that has L on the top of it, that's the liquid, and the letter T is for the tube. So we can see that the center of gravity is the center. It stays in the center. Liquid moves with the tube. So with single phase, Coriolis meters are working very well. Now let's look at two-phase flow with high viscosity and compare that to the single phase. So we'll notice that the gas bubble stays entrained inside the liquid and we see a little bit of movement with the center of gravity, but it's not a huge amount. And the reason why the air bubble stays inside the liquid is because this is a higher viscosity fluid, making that bubble stay entrained inside the liquid. So this is what we would call the, the best case scenario for two-phase flow. So low drive frequency and high viscosity fluid is the best case scenario for two-phase flow. So comparing this to two-phase flow, low drive frequency, and low viscosity, we see a little bit more movement with the gas bubble, which can, cause, can start causing some 
some two-phase flow, and we can start getting some decoupling between the liquid and the gas. Now with high frequency, we see that the air bubble really starts to move back and forth. And we start getting some severe two-phase flow due to the decoupling. And we see that we're off, our center of gravity is moving quite rapidly compared to lower drive frequency. And you can see the difference between high viscosity and low viscosity fluids on how the entrained gas bubble will stay in, entrained inside the liquid instead of decoupling. All right. Let's take a look at some of the questions that are coming through here. One of the questions is, does vibrations in the system affect the meter? Um, it's a very good question on, on vibrations. So. With dual tube technology, uh, vibration is really not an issue. You'd have to come within a half a hertz of the drive coil in order to affect the drive signal of the Coriolis meter. Now, we're using these two tubes that are in here, and you're using one for reference that's on there. And the reason what really helps us out is that we're not using the outer case like the legacy meters used to, and where you would really get a lot of vibration issues. So vibration's really not an issue, uh, but it's also best practice to, if you have a, a pump, a PD pump, a positive displacement pump that sweeps over a bunch of different frequencies, to not put the Coriolis meter right up against that PD pump. So I have seen some cases where that could possibly affect it, but vibration's really not a huge issue. So how accurate is two-phase flow with cryogenic gases? So I'm going to uh, defer that question. I'm going to take that question down, and I will get back to you on that, on that question. So how does entrained gas reduce flow meter accuracy? So what entrained gas does and how it affects and trained uh, uh, flow meter accuracy is that it causes that outer balance that you saw with that center of gravity. So when those tubes get out of balance, then you really start seeing a lot of peaks and valleys going along inside your flow rate. Your flow rate becomes really erratic. So what is considered high and low frequencies? So high frequency is around 700 hertz, so 700 to 1,000 hertz on the drive frequency. Low frequency is around 100 to 150 hertz. So how will the meter perform if the liquid has some solid particles dispersed? The uh, meter actually works quite well on slurries. So if you have some particles that are dispersed inside the meter itself, uh, we're measuring mass as it goes through. So it, it works quite well on, on measuring with, with particles that are dispersed through the system. All right, so we'll just move on to the rest of the presentation here, and then I will field some more questions as we move along. 
So the next part that we're going to talk about is field verification and maintenance. So the most important adjustment to a Coriolis meter during calibration is the flow calibration factor. So this adjusts the span of the measurement. There's no other adjustment that is important in some gas applications where the range of flow rates will be wide. This is known as the meter zero adjustment. So if you think back to the phase shift between the two pickoff coils and the proportional relationship between that and the mass flow rate, you can imagine that the relationship in the straight line would look like the one that's on the graph that I'm showing you right now. So the equation for the line is Y equals MX plus B. So this is where B is the intercept or where the point the line crosses. The phase shift axis is the mass flow rate. X value is equal to zero. The term M in the equation is the slope of the line, and it defines how much phase shift is equal to a certain amount of flow rate. So the meter adjustment is the way to eliminate measurement error due to zero or what we call the letter B. And the flow calibration factor is the parameter that is set to the slope of the line or the span relationship between the phase shift of the raw pickoff signals and the mass flow rate. So you can see where the meter zero is where the flow calibration factor is with the slope, meter zero being the y-intercept, and how that band changes. Let's look at the Coriolis meter zeroing best practices. So the best practices that we recommend is using the flow calibration factor and the zero factor that were set at the factory in all applications unless there's some evidence or adjustment that needs both factors to be improved or to improve measurement accuracy. So we also provide the tools that can be used to check the flow calibration factor and the zero value of the meter after it's been installed or find out before making any changes or adjustments to improve the measurement accuracy. So one of the things we also need to do in order to verify after installation to verify our zero is to ensure uh, no flow condition, to zero the meter, take a look at what our live zero is doing, you know, make sure that that live zero is not a large number, ensure the meter is full of fluid. So before we even fill the meter fluid, we want to check to make sure that our, uh, what our live zero is doing so we don't have any installation effects. Then we can charge the meter full of fluid of either gas or liquid, ensure that the process conditions are stable, lock the meter in, and then we could be able to perform our meter zero. But there's also another way of doing this as well that also takes the guesswork out of all of this, and this is the zero verification tool. So this is something that's available in the 5700 transmitter itself or in ProLink 3 that you can run this algorithm, and this algorithm will tell you whether or not the zero that you're currently at is the proper zero or if you need to re actually re-zero the meter. So it takes out the guesswork of zeroing the sensor. So the next part of this is let's take a look at smart meter verification and how that works. So how smart meter verification works is that we are testing the structural integrity of the tubes. How has tube stiffness changed since the meter has left the factory? And that baseline is inside the core processor of the meter itself. So we have that baseline tube stiffness inside of the meter itself. So then what we do is we end up sending a signal 
from the core processor to the tubes, checking the structural integrity of those tubes, and then it runs an algorithm and it comes back and lets you know, comparing it to the factory baseline of whether the, the meter has changed since it's left the factory. The rule of thumb is that if the meter has changed by more than 4%, then we no longer can guarantee the flat spec for the meter. So for example, for an elite Coriolis meter, that would be 0.1% of flow rate, 0 0.005 grams per cc on standard, that we could no longer guarantee that flat spec if we have more than 4% change in tube stiffness. So some of the other things to also recognize on smart meter verification is that AGA 11 acknowledges that valid secondary verification methods may be used to bolster measurement confidence of Coriolis meters in natural gas applications. There's potential benefits of having the ability to perform an in-situ check to confirm the accuracy of the meter, and also including uh, reducing system losses and better system balance. So this is a very low cost method, rather than having to shut down the system, everything could be done in situ. You could do this while the meter is flowing. You don't have to shut the system down, and you also don't have to take the meter out of service and send it back to the factory for recalibration unnecessarily. Because most likely you'll probably get something back that says as left as found, and it was probably something inside the process rather than the, than the meter itself. So to bring this more to light on how we get the stiffness method and why we bring this into it, um, the secondary attribute of Coriolis meter is the, the best thing to observe as a diagnostic to confirm that the meter's calibration has not changed. And that answer is the stiffness of the flow tubes, as I mentioned before. So on the screen that we're taking a look at here is the example of a smart meter verification inspection report. This is a report that you could print out in, in ProLink 3 or AMS. So it also tells you the um, you know, what the tube flow tube stiffness test was, and you can print this out as a report for quality records. So a couple of other things that smart meter verification helps with, um, again, we're checking that structural integrity of the meter. It allows in situ verification. There's no flow interruption. There's no need for gas composition. And with no need for process condition uh, measurements, things like temperature and pressure. And it's fully automated. It's something that you can set. You can set it up. You can uh, schedule smart meter verification to run so many times, or it could be operator initiated. All right. So the last part of the this webinar today that I'd like to discuss with you is one of the biggest advancements that's going on right now is the Micromotion Model 5700 transmitter. This is a transmitter that's already uh, released and that's out there. And we've discussed different, you know, difficult process issues. And this is a device that can help with measurement confidence, process insight, and help us out with these difficult process upsets. So some of the things that the 5700 brings to the table is that it, it improves productivity, the elimination of need for special tools, and minimizes the time in the field. It also brings measurement confidence. So it also has the diagnostics that we'll talk about, zero verification, smart meter verification. So those are all things that bring measurement confidence to the table. There's also process insight, the ability to 
be able to get to go back into time and to take a look at what's going on from the process rather than having to wait around to see if my process changes or try to recreate a process subset that went on um, or try to do some data logging to hope that I find out uh, what that intermittent problem is that's going on inside my process. So I can go back and take a look at data that's already inside the transmitter, graph that data. Uh, I can also send that data over here to, to Micromotion and ask one of our technicians to take a look at this data and make a recommendation on what we could possibly do to help out with that process upset. So one of the things that would be you know, fully configurable from the front display, and there's no need for you know, service tool to configure the, the, the item, the transmitter. Um, I've been out in the field quite a, t a bit of times, and you always have to bring a handheld communicator, some other cables. So it's nice that if I don't have all that equipment with me and I need to make a quick change in the transmitter itself, I certainly can do this by using the front display without having to uh, use any other kind of device. And the four button navigation helps out quite a bit rather than the two button navigation that we've been used to in the past. And the alarm codes are out there. It tells you exactly what's going on with the alarm codes. Um, the one that's on here, it tells you the configuration error, gives you what the alarm code is, and then also explains what the alarm code is doing and then how to correct the problem. Another nice thing about the transmitter is that it's also available in a, a variety of different languages. So if you need to change the language from English to uh, Spanish, Portuguese, Russian, French, Chinese, Japanese, all of those languages are supported with 5700 device. So we talked about two-phase flow indication, and that was one of the things that uh, customers keep coming back to us and saying, well, how can, we, how can you notify me that something's actually going on inside my system and let me know the level of entrained gas that I have going on or two-phase flow inside my system. Well, think of this as a green, yellow, and red light for your process when it comes to two-phase flow indication. So what the 5700 does is it'll give you single-phase measurement and it'll tell you that it's accurate and repeatable. So that'll, that'll be your green light. Your yellow light will tell you that you have some moderately entrained gas and the meter may be outside the accuracy specification. It will also give you the red light of severe entrainment and meters likely neither accurate or repeatable due to that two-phase flow, severe two-phase flow entrainment. So back to zero verification, this is something that's always plagued our users out in the field that should I zero the meter or should I not zero the sensor? And the data that they've been getting from us over the years, um, we've actually you know, confused our, our customers on, okay, on legacy equipment, you need to wait for the meter to warm up, get at the process conditions, and then zero it three times. So then we had some of our customers that were actually putting that spec into their um, standard operating procedures and then going back to that. Now, ever since the advent of multivariable digital platform, or MVD, there really wasn't a need to actually zero the sensor, only in certain situations when you had uh, possibly an increase in temperature. You know, so there were some outlying, uh, some outliers. So you couldn't say that you don't zero on with MVD technology. There were some outliers, especially when you're dealing with high temperature applications. So this is where zero verification comes into play. And this is what the most important piece is, is, that it takes all the guesswork out of it. So in the 5700 transmitter itself, it's already on board. You can run the zero verification wizard. What this does is it runs an algorithm and tells you, takes a look at what your current zero is, takes a look at what your process is doing, and then recommends whether a new zero is recommended or not. If a new zero is recommended, then this is when we need to Lock in the sensor, make sure that the tubes are packed full of process fluid, and then we pro uh, properly zero the sensor when it's at conditions. 
We've got to make sure that we're not having any leaky pumps or seals or any two-phase flow going through there because if we t improperly zero the meter, that's our reference and that's our starting point. So then our reference is off. So zero verification on board in the 5700, but it's also available with ProLink 3. So if you have your transmitters that are out there, you can run zero verification with ProLink 3, which is our configuration device for speaking to our transmitters, communicating with our transmitter devices. So process insight. This is a very powerful tool because inside the 5700 itself, it'll it's got a, uh, a memory card, an SD card that's inside of it, and it will log data and histori historical data. So we have short-term data that will be logged, one-second data for 30 days or up to a month, and then long-term five-minute data for 15 years, for about 10 to 15 years, depending on how much data is in there. So what this very powerful tool does is it allows us to go back, take a look at what the process upset was, and to figure out the problem. Rather than having to go back and spend time chasing around ghosts to see where that process upset happened and see if I could recreate that issue. All right, well, that um, concludes the webinar uh, slides. So let me start taking a look at, I'm sure that there's a lot of questions that are going on here, so let me take a look at the questions. We do have 15 minutes or more than that to start answering questions. We'll start off here at the top. Is it possible to install 5700 on existing flow meters? The correct answer is yes. So if you have a meter that's out there that has its uh, right now, uh, for most remotely applications, so remote transmitters, um, right now I know we're still working on the integral mount piece. Uh, you can integral mount on CMFS, um, but for remote mount transmitters, you can work with either a 700 standard core processor or 800 core processor. Okay, how do you uh, get the smart meter verification information back? Can you get it via heart or do you have to do it via a laptop? So to get the smart meter verification information back, if you want to get a, a report back, you have to do that via a laptop. But if you just want to get back that it either passed or failed, you can get that through via heart and set up an event using ProLink or another device to configure the transmitter itself. But if you just want to get a pass or fail, you can certainly get that through Heart. But if you want to get the full report, you have to be using a, a laptop device. How critical is installation alignment for meter zero? The strain or torque from misalignment shift zero? Yes and yes. So very important on alignment. Pipe alignment is huge. If you have misaligned pipe, that's going to create a lot of zero issues. And the best thing that you can do when you install a meter, it, and if, if you're seeing that you bring your three biggest guys out there or you have a, a come along that you have to install the sensor, then you know you're gonna have an issue because if you put any kind of torque or strain on the meter itself, that's going to shift that meter zero. Uh, the best thing to do is when you install the sensor is to take a look at what that live zero is. And if it's a uh, significantly large number, before you even fill the meter full of fluid, you need to take a look at what that live zero is. If it's a large number, then that means that you have some type of installation effect. And that could be that you're supporting the piping with your meter. You want the piping to support your meter, not the other way around. A very good question there. How do you determine acceptable minimum flow rate for entrained gas applications? 
Well, that all depends on the viscosity of the fluid. And what you'd really need to do is if it's a lower viscosity fluid, the higher the flow rate, the better. Uh, because I'm going to give you worst case scenario so that if it's a lower viscosity fluid and the entrained gas is able to separate or decouple from the fluid, um, it would be better to have it at a at a higher flow rate. So if you can be in between what the flow rate is, and this is what our um, inside sales and our field sales representatives can help you with on uh, on sizing up a sensor uh, accurately. But yeah, the the worst case is that if you're dealing with a low viscosity fluid and you're at these lower flow rates, we have to be careful so that we're not getting uh, severe two phase flow. And this is where our inside sales and our our field uh, service and our um, field sales can help you out, and I can certainly help with that if you have a uh, an application that you'd like for me to take a look at. Okay, another question is: I used a micro motion meter on a tank car um, to. Uh, unload previously, and we received false flow readings because between unloads, meters was partially full. Is there a way to correct this issue? Yes, the way to correct that issue is to set up a low flow cutoff. And what you want to do is what that low flow cutoff does is that it tells the meter, the transmitter, that you don't want to start counting flow until you get above a certain amount that's going through the meter, and then it'll start counting. But if you have little droplets that are in there that you don't want to count and then the meter's not full, and you don't want to count that that's going through there, you can set up this low number that's on there by setting up a low flow cutoff. Now, I also caution to be careful with that because if you set that low flow cutoff too high, you can end up seeing flow going through the meter without any flow indication because we set that low flow cutoff too high. So be careful in setting that. And if you do need help with that, um, we do have you know, our field service techs. Field sales can help you, and I can also help you as well to, to take a look at your application. All right, so to... To, declare my, to clarify my previous comment, we ran smart meter verification baseline at ambient conditions. The operating temperature is around 300 degrees Fahrenheit. The unit was failing SMB because the tube stiffness is a function of temperature. Our local vendor rebaselined the meter. And let's see, look, look at cut off the rest of your. Um, so, let's see, oh, you're right here again. Is the temperature measurement taken in the product or externally on the tubes? If so, how does it affect accuracy? So the temperature of the product of the, of the Coriolis meter is taking on the tubes itself because we're taking a look at the modulus of elasticity. So if I have, if I'm in a really cold environment and I'm not getting enough twist, I need to compensate for that. If I'm in a really hot environment and I'm getting too much twist, I need to compensate for that. So that's where that RTD comes in. It's on the tubes itself, not inside the process fluid. If you do need something that's inside the process fluid, you can disconnect the RTD and then use a thermal well inside the process fluid. When you install two or more meters in parallel, is there any interference from one to another vibration? So there isn't any vibration issues. I've seen meters in parallel to each other. Uh, there's no crosstalk uh, between the two sensors itself. I've seen them uh, meters in the field that have been, you know, flange to flange next to each other, and there isn't any crosstalk issues. All right, can you go back to the beginning about the operation and explain uh, when and if you are using full flow through the meter? Can you explain more about the reference tube? and how it's affected by flow compared to the other tube. Now, there isn't one tube that's considered to be reference and the other one to be considered the actual measuring tube. The whole device is measuring flow. 
the only reason why that we have that that tube tube that's in there that we split the tube in between that so that we're not referencing the outer case. What we're doing is we're controlling the amplitude of the tubes. We bring them out to a certain ref, uh, a certain amplitude, and then back to a zero a zero reference. Then it also asks, can you explain if you are using full flow through full flow through the meter? Yes, we are using um, full flow through the meter. We, uh, we mask the air bubbles of entrained gas by adding a relay in series with the frequency output on the model 1500 transmitter. So that the relay is only on with the valve being on, since the low flow cutoff setting didn't really work for us. Okay. Good comment there. Another question is, are there pressure considerations? Um, if you can clarify what that, uh, of what you're asking there with pressure considerations. Um, yes, I mean, yes, there are in certain situations. And I can get you some more information on that. Oh, fluid pressure limits, okay. Um, each Coriolis meter, if you take a look at the, the product data sheet, that they have a, a pressure limit, and um, we do have high pressure products as well. So it depends on what pressure limits that you're looking for, and we can certainly uh, let you know what products would fit your application. Um, I know that there's uh, maybe have a copy of your PowerPoint for our internal training. Um, before I send out the uh, the copy of the PowerPoint, I'm going to check with our legal department to make sure that's that's okay. But um, yeah, I'm all for everybody uh, having a copy of the PowerPoint and being able to do their own internal training and um, using me as a reference if uh, you guys if you guys need help. So let me check on that and then I will get back to everybody and making sure that they. Um, um, on the uh, copy of the PowerPoint. Um, let's see, I think I answered this one about the, the temperature measurement taken in the product or externally on the tubes. If so, how does it affect accuracy? So the RTD is on the outside of the tubes. We're measuring the elasticity and the rigidity of the tubes. Um, it doesn't affect the accuracy of, of mass flow. It's more of the accuracy of where you want your temperature. Uh, we have customers that take the temperature measurement off the meter itself, plus or minus one degree Celsius. Uh, so if that temperature measurement is not accurate enough, then um, we'll as, as see them use a, a temperature transmitter or a, a thermal well inside the actual liquid itself. Next question is, what is the biggest size for liquid application available and what pipe rating? So the, the biggest size meter that Micromotion currently has today is the high capacity four or HC4 meter. And that is a uh, 12 inch pipeline size. And then as far as the, the, the pipe rating, um, I can get into any kind of application that you want there. Um, I, have, I can send you the product data sheet if that works. But yeah, it's, uh, high capacity four is the largest that we do. It's a 12-inch pipeline size. We do have sizes that are lower than that. There's the HC2, which is six inch, six to eight inch, and then the HC3, which is eight to 10 inch. Uh, one other question is, how can we contact you? You can contact me through my email at anthony.gentil at emerson.com. So that's A-N-T-H-O-N-Y dot G-E-N-T-I-L-E at Emerson, so it's E-M-E-R-S-O-N dot com.
So what electrical installation certifications, certifications does, does it have? Um, for the 50, uh, for the 5700, um, we have ATX approval. Um, not quite sure about FM or IC uh, EX. I know that there's, uh, we probably have those as well. I'm sure we have uh, ATEX on there. And there's other uh, transmitters that we have as, as well, but I can certainly send you the, the product data sheets. So if you wouldn't mind following up with me on that and just send me an email, I can get back to you on that. And I'll, I'll, um, I'll follow up on that. So I'll just leave that as, as unanswered and then I can come back and get you a uh, product data sheet. Uh, let's see, for compressed natural gas applications, how do uh, varying pressures affect meter accuracy? I'm going to talk that over with our uh, natural gas application specialist and then get back to you on that one, so I'll leave that one as unanswered. So proving displacer friction. What do you what do I mean by proving displacer friction? Let me take a look at that on where that is on my slides here. I'm gonna leave that one as unanswered as well and I'll get back to you on that one. Another question, are Coriolis meters recommended for corrosive liquids like sulfuric acid? Uh, yeah, it also depends on, um, you know, you can use that. We do have products that uh, have C22 alloy, and it also depends on the weight percentage of the sulfuric acid. But we do have uh, meters that are in service right now that are working on um, sulfuric acid applications. But it all depends on the weight percentage. If it's like um, and we also take a look at what our materials construction are. We have a, a corrosion guide that we use and, uh, to, to recommend the right materials of construction for our customers. The next question is, is the SMB report approved for third-party auditing and traceable to NIST? I know that there's um, some third-party traceability that we have going on right now, um, but I will follow up with you on that one and get you all of the approvals on uh, what we have for, uh, for third-party. Another question, is the two-phase flow notification part of the heart signal or only indicated on the transmitter in the field? Uh, you could set it up as a hard or Modbus signal that you could set up as an event um, by configuring the transmitter, and you can get that over. Um, you can set that set that up, and then send that over to uh, your you know, your control system, and then um, it would signal somebody on um, on the alarm itself. Another question, does the 5700 show any significant improvement in pulse stability for meter proving in custody applications? Um, not that I know off offhand, but I will follow up with you on, on that one. All right, we have a, uh, we have three 10 inch Coriolis meters and are proving with a flow uh, small volume prover. We, when we unbolted the meter, it, sh it shifted approximately one inch. We suspect the meter is in a bind. We cannot obtain a 0 0.05 repeatability. Any suggestions? So yeah, it sounds like you have some type of installation effect there uh, with some misaligned pipe. Um, another thing too that that also uh, is the issue is that we're also going up against. Uh, we're not doing an apples to apples technology, but I understand the, what's going on with the, the issue there of, um, you know, when you're when you're proving, you have to go up against the volumetric prover because that's the that's the law that's set. Um, but yeah, in that situation, if it ends up shifting on you like that, the zero ends up shifting on you. That sounds like there's an installation effect that you may may be supporting 
the piping with the meter rather than the meter being supported by the piping. And again, if that's not answering your, your question, you know, you know, please follow up and I'm here to help you. So are there any built-in indicators that flange, that flange two-phase flow instead of assumed single phase? So some of the built-in indicators uh, that you can see, and even on legacy devices, uh, things like drive gain, and then also taking a look at the uh, the meter itself, uh, the um, the LCD that's on there. All right, um, last couple questions here. Is SMB only available with 5700 transmitter? No, it's available on, on all of our transmitters except for 1700. Uh, it also depends on whether you have 700 or 800 core, so on 800 core processors only. And it looks like um, we're at our, our end here. Um, I will follow up on the rest of these questions. Okay, great. Um, yeah, uh, just to uh, to let everybody know, there will be a, a link with the presentation uh, sent out within 24 hours of the, uh, the conclusion of the webinar today. Um, I'd like to thank Anthony for providing such a compelling presentation. I'd also like to thank all of you for taking the time out of your busy day to attend the webinar. Um, we encourage you to share the link that you receive uh, via email uh, following the presentation or view the presentation again yourselves. If you would like more information about Micromotion and its Coriolis flow measurement technology, please visit micromotion.com. Thanks again and have a great day. And thank you, everybody. And also, I will get back to you on all of your questions. Um, I will get with, uh, with Don24 and I have everybody's email. So if you didn't get your question answered, uh, we do take your questions seriously, and if you need to follow up, um, I will also uh, you know, get with you guys and make sure that everybody gets their question answered. So thanks again. I really appreciate everybody's time, and thank you for your customer loyalty.